Hello, welcome to the podcast. Uh, we're going to cover intro to metabolism. Uh, so really we're going to talk about enzymes. We're going to talk about the basics with energy that we'll need to know for photosynthesis and cell respiration. Uh, it's kind of titled weird because if you're following along in the 5th edition Campbell Biology book, uh, it's chapter 6. If you're following along in the 8th edition or 7th, uh, it's actually chapter 8. But I'm going to put it right after chapter 5. So regardless, this is how we're going to cover it. So moving on, let's kind of describe what exactly metabolism is. So when we talk about metabolism, it's going to be all of the chemical reactions that occur in your body. So when we do this, it's going to be all the ones that build stuff, all the ones that tear it apart. Anything that's a chemical reaction is going to fall under this metabolic idea. Now a lot of people use metabolism, where they'll talk about like my high metabolism, uh, and we kind of tend to treat that as though it's breaking stuff down, you know, burning fat and things like that. But in reality, it's also building muscle. It's also storing stuff, even if it's storing stuff literally as long-term storage, like fat. Uh, if you're converting sugar to fats, that's part of your metabolism. Uh, so I guess somebody could argue that uh, the fact that you take and convert all your stuff to long-term storage in fats, you still have a fairly active metabolism. Uh, it's just not active in the way you want it to be. You might also see this bioenergetics term used. Uh, and bio obviously is life, energetics is just how we get our energy so we can live. So when we talk about stuff today, we'll talk about these catabolic pathways. And so this is the stuff that's going to typically break stuff down into smaller pieces. So if you remember what we talked about before, this will be stuff that kind of follows along with the hydrolysis idea, where you're going to take something, let's kind of draw a little molecule here. Uh, and we're ultimately going to take and try to break that into two separate pieces, break it apart. With anabolic pathways, these are going to be building pathways. Uh, that's why anabolic steroids make you build muscle. Uh, you would not want to take catabolic steroids if you want to be stronger. That would be stupid. Uh, anabolic pathways are going to then take things and do the exact opposite. So they are going to work in reverse here. And so these ones will be the ones that fall into this uh, more dehydration reactions or dehydration synthesis you might see it written as. Uh, sometimes they'll also call them condensation reactions if you ever see that term. Don't freak out, it's the same idea. Uh, so these ones are going to be building stuff. So like this one ultimately will get you more towards the polymer idea from before, whereas this one will get you more towards the monomer idea that we've talked about before. So that's just a kind of quick overview. Uh, we're going to discuss too in terms of energy uh, coming up here and just kind of keep in mind that usually when you destroy stuff or not destroy but when you break stuff down is a better term we're not getting rid of it uh, when you do that you're typically going to release energy overall and when you want to build stuff for our body when you want to make things bigger it's typically going to cost you energy and so you have to make sure you plan for that as your body tries to go through and balance things out so thermodynamics this is the study of energy specifically energy transformations uh, and so energy itself is just this capacity to do work. So this is how our body can function. Uh, if we want to move something throughout our body, we need to focus on energy. Uh, if, so that includes cell transport, that includes moving blood around, your heart beating, that includes the muscles as you try and run, or even just do minor things like lift your hand up to change the channel. All those things are ultimately going to require energy. Now, of that, there's two big types of energy that we'll just kind of briefly deal with. The first is kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. So that's any time you're moving. So, you know, as so you wave things around, that's going to be kinetic energy. Uh, any time you have things like cell pumps that pump, whether it's water, ions, anything like that, it's going to be kinetic energy that you're using. Potential energy is going to be energy that's going to be from position. Now you guys are probably used to this from like physical science where it's more like you know you've got this cliff, you've got this rock here and so based on its position if I give it a push gravity will pull it down. And so because its position is elevated it can have this energy there that's stored because of its height. And as it goes down that potential energy gets converted to kinetic energy. So it goes from potential to kinetic. Well in chemicals what normally happens is we have these bonds and based upon the exact bonds, there's certain, you can think of it as like energy stored there. And if I allow these molecules to shift around, to reorganize, so essentially I split this and allow it to convert to this, 
in some cases this bond will have less energy and so when it goes from here to here we can have energy that's released as it goes from a higher energy bond to a lower energy bond just think the universe in general is lazy so things want to go to a low energy level they want to go from up here to down here just like most of you guys in general want to do whatever's easiest whatever takes the least amount of energy you normally don't volunteer to do things more complex than are needed uh, you typically don't do more of your homework than is needed because we all kind of gravitate to this low energy idea and molecules are no different and so when we talk about position keep in mind oftentimes this will be the position of atoms or molecules when we're talking about biology or chemistry and that's where our energy is stored so that's why we can talk about there being energy in these molecules like sugar which has four calories per gram of energy that's basically stored there or four kilocalories if we're being accurate uh, and then you've got fats which have nine you know they're much more energetic it's much more packed with these bonds uh, because these carbon hydrogen bonds basically are a higher energy bond as we break them apart we can get a fair amount of energy from them so that's how this process will work you have to put in a little bit of energy actually to kind of break this bond but when you reform it with a lower energy bond some of that or the extra energy is released so if you went from and I'm just making numbers up this isn't intended to be crazy accurate uh, but if you have say 10 and I'm just gonna put an energy unit this is just all theoretical just to help you think if this one has 10 joules of energy in this bond and we allow it to form one that's essentially stable enough at 4 joules we would then have 6 joules that are allowed to like escape All right. so that's kind of the idea behind what we're doing here now thermo thermodynamics has two laws uh, the first law you guys probably have heard it as the conservation of energy uh, you may also have heard uh, the idea that energy cannot be created nor destroyed now I just kind of think of it where energy can only be transferred or transformed so you can transfer energy uh, turn on your stove go walk over put your hand on it don't actually do this but you will transfer thermal or heat energy from the stove to your hand that's just a straight-up transfer it's still heat energy or thermal energy in both scenarios now for transformation this is where I might do something like in your car where you have let's see if I can do a horrible rendition of a gas can uh, so you're gonna have this gas can that's got gas inside when this is in your car you're going to burn that gas you're gonna do a chemical reaction and as a side effect if you feel your hood uh, or if you really want to I guess you can put your hand on the exhaust or in the engine you're gonna see that it's gonna get hot and so we're gonna give off as it burns heat and so this is changed because we went from the gasoline which is essentially chemical energy right stored in those bonds and those position of those atoms and now it's been converted to heat so that's going to be a transformation we've shifted from one type of energy to another the second law says whenever we do these transformations it increases entropy and entropy just means disorder all right so whenever we go through when we're doing these reactions it things want to break down if you take one thing and make it into two you've made it become more disordered you're also typically whenever we do reactions we're gonna get the release of heat and so that's another common thing you'll see here is that whenever you do chemical reactions you're gonna release heat because they're not 100 percent efficient if I can do the percent sign here without screwing it up too bad okay so when you're doing this process you're always gonna have some loss when our body tries to shift things transform things from chemical energy to a different type of chemical energy to thermal energy to whatever there's almost always gonna be or there is always gonna be some loss it, it's just how it works so if you want to store a certain amount of food you wanna store chemical energy as fat you are going to have to eat a larger amount of energy if you will than you ultimately want to store because in the process of going through these chemical conversions to eventually make it go from protein and carbohydrates and other types of fats to the type of fat that you want you're gonna lose some at every step so it's kinda like if you have something you sell for five dollars but everybody else who sells this marks it up so the person who bought it from you for five dollars sells it to somebody else for ten dollars and then they sell it to somebody else for twenty dollars 
And so every time it changes hands, there's this markup. It's not like it's $5, $5, $5, and it kind of stays at that particular amount. That value ultimately is going to be where it's increased that if you want to get that same thing down the line, it's going to cost you more because there's losses along the way uh, because of the second law of thermodynamics. So these are our two laws, and these are the ideas that we want you to keep in mind. It's not 100% efficient. Typically, you're going to lose stuff for heat. They want to be disordered, so if you want to make things ordered, like build muscle, it's going to take energy that it doesn't want to do that on its own. Now, free energy is this term for the, the within any system, there's going to be a lot of energy that we just can't use. Right? That's just normal. You have certain things that are very stably bonded that don't want to or in some cases really can't go to a much lower energy level. So even though they have some energy stored there, it's not energy you can get to, that you can access. And so if we look at kind of what we have that we can use, that's our free energy. And it's typically represented with this delta G idea. If something has a positive delta G, that means it's typically going to be absorbing energy. It's, it's going to be a taker. It's going to be typically anabolic, if you want to use those terms. And if you have a negative delta G, that means you're releasing energy. So this one is going to release, and this one is typically going to be catabolic processes. All right. So if we look at this, we'll see that a lot of our processes, like cell respiration that breaks stuff down, will be this catabolic process. Uh, but then they'll also have aspects of them that are anabolic where they're going to build something else with that. And we'll talk about coupled reactions in a bit that these two ideas are going to go together where we are going to typically take things that have a negative delta G and try and pair them up with things that have a positive delta G because otherwise we couldn't do those things that have a positive delta G because they won't happen spontaneously. You know, they're not going to just happen on their own. Now let's discuss the two main ways that reactions can kind of go down. Uh, the first type, and this type will typically be anabolic once again, is going to have this energy of activation, which sometimes I've seen it like Ea or A sub E. But this is the amount of energy that we have to put into a reaction to get it started. You know, because initially you've got to break bonds, that takes energy. So to get a reaction going, we have to put this energy in. Now we'll get some of that energy back. So at the end, typically, when it kind of falls, sometimes you think of bonds as like a well. Uh, so if you talk about the amount of energy that you have, you initially have where these bonds have a high amount of energy, and it takes energy. We have to kind of go up in energy to snap them, right? So it's kind of like you're pulling them out of this little well that they're in. So you've got this kind of dip. That's the energy dip. That's what makes a, a molecule stable. So you've got to pull it up out of there. That takes energy. But then eventually, if you want to form a new bond, there'll be another well. So you're going to kind of fall back in there, so it's going to release energy when you form the bond. So in this case, it's going to take more energy to break those bonds than we get when we form them. So we're kind of going here from a low energy to high energy. Because of this, we've got this energy that we don't get back. We put in, but we don't get back. So this is going to be our delta G. This is going to be what we have to give in terms of free energy to get this to work. So this is called endergonic, ender for in. It's taking in energy from the surroundings to allow the reaction to occur. So this is typically going to be, once again, an anabolic type thing that we'll see. These are typically going to be non-spontaneous. These are essentially going to be more of like a taker, if you will, uh, as far as energy goes. Now on the other side, we've got exergonic, or out. So these guys are going to be much more of like a giver in terms of energy. Because we still have where we have to put in a bit of energy, right? Our activation energy. So I'll just put energy of activation is what I'll use for here. And so we're going to put that in. That's going to let us snap this bond, pull it out of that energy well. And then we get to dip it into a much deeper energy well, right? So we get a lot more energy out of this than we put in. We actually get all the energy we put in back. So if there's enough, if there's like a high enough temperature, if there's enough of collisions going on as these particles move, in many cases these reactions can actually be spontaneous because there's enough energy just in the surroundings period to allow this to occur without needing a flame or some other help to make this happen. But overall we're going to have a delta G now that's negative because we're giving off energy and so this will release energy into the surroundings and it will release this much energy, right? Because we put this in, activated, 
but we haven't got it back. And then we got back some extra. So this one will give us energy, and we can actually take this energy we just got, and we can try to plug it in over here so that these reactions, exergonic reactions, can drive endergonic ones and allow them to occur. So these catabolic type exergonic ones can let our anabolic uh, endergonic type ones occur. So energy coupling, we're going to pair up endergonic and exergonic, but remember overall we're still going to have to have where these together, added together, are still going to have to have uh, negative delta G. And the reason for that, if you haven't figured this out, give you a second here, is because the reactions are not 100% efficient. So we are going to have some heat loss. We are going to have some loss of that energy. So we have to account for that. So it's kind of like assuming if you wanted to buy something, once again, that's 10 bucks, you need to have like 15 bucks to make sure. Because you know that when you walk around, there's like that hole in your pocket, if you will, that loses money. And so you've got to make sure that you have extra. And it's the same way here. When we do these energy transformations, we lose some of it. So we have to make sure that the exergonic reaction is giving off more than the endergonic is taking in. So it's always got to be a bit lopsided. And then one of the common ways that we'll store stuff is we'll pair up an exergonic reaction with a specific endergonic reaction, and that's to build this ATP molecule. So we'll do actually the opposite of this, is what we actually do with a lot of our metabolism, where we'll take adenosine diphosphate, or ADP, and we're going to add a phosphate, and we're going to add energy. And that lets us make ATP, which is kind of the universal currency in all cells, all living organisms. We all use this. It's some great evidence for this, this common ancestor that used ATP. And then what happens is when we want to use energy later on, we don't have to try to figure out how to convert sugar directly into whatever we need, like uh, to make a gradient. Instead, what we can do is we'll separately convert sugar when we break it down into ATP, and then I'll use ATP for whatever else I want. So if I want to pump something in the cell, I can take ATP, I can split it apart into ADP, and a phosphate, and I will get energy. So this reaction, when it's run this way, the way that it's shown, ATP to ADP plus phosphate, will actually have a negative delta G, so it will be an exergonic reaction that we can use to drive stuff. And then after we are done with that, we can take these pieces, ADP and phosphate, and we can drive them backwards, so we can essentially do the opposite, the endergonic reaction, to rebuild it. And we'll do that by breaking down other stuff like fats and proteins and carbohydrates. And we'll take the energy we get from breaking them down to rebuild ATP. And then the ATP, once again, is the universal currency that does whatever we want inside of our cells, inside of our bodies. And why this works so effectively is because of a process called phosphorylation, where this phosphate that we kind of pull off of ATP you know, because it's now adenosine triphosphates become adenosine diphosphate. We've just removed a phosphate. And what we typically do is actually stick that phosphate to something else. In many cases, it will be an enzyme, a type of protein that's going to help reactions occur. And by sticking that phosphate on them, it'll oftentimes change the shape of the enzyme to allow it to do a job or allow it to make a job easier to occur, a chemical reaction happen uh, that otherwise may not happen. You can also stick it on other molecules, and it can do the same basic effect, uh, where it can help transfer that energy in that bond uh, when it's split and it attaches to somebody else to allow them to use that energy to then accomplish their task. So that's kind of how ATP does its job. That's how ATP is useful as this energy currency molecule. Now looking at this then, we've got the exergonic reactions, where we see the reactants have quite a bit of energy. The products don't. The reactants of an endergonic reaction don't have that much. The products have more. And so if we stick these together, you're just kind of seeing that we can have both these occur at the same time. But the net is still exergonic. You'll notice that overall, we're, st we're still going from a higher energy level to a lower energy level because of that loss. We can't just have it be even. But it allows us to take one thing and break it. So you can see glucose. So this is ultimately going to be C6H12O6 is being broken down into CO2s, H2Os. So it's, it's being broken down to many small pieces, six and six of each of these. And then we've got where, a, in this case, amino acids are being stuck together. 
So this will be via these dehydration reactions uh, to make a polypeptide. So we're building on one side and we're using the energy from breaking down glucose on the other. And you'll see in between these, we're using ATP, where when we break down glucose into CO2 and H2O, that allows us to make ADP and a phosphate bind to become ATP. And when we're making the amino acids build together to be a polypeptide, which takes energy, we get that energy by breaking ATP apart into ADP and a phosphate. So there's a cycle where ATP is being broken down to let us build, and then we're breaking other stuff down to let us rebuild the ATP. And so it's this kind of indirect process where breaking down the glucose doesn't directly give us energy to build a polypeptide. Instead, we've got ATP as our middleman, our universal middleman. So that way we don't have to have pathways that are able to make glucose become every single you know, possible molecule. Uh, instead, we just have where ATP is what ultimately can be used to do any of our tasks. And then we have separate processes that when we break down anything, makes ATP. So it gives us this consistency just like you would hate it if you were somewhere where there was like 20 different types of currency. And so it made it very difficult to go through if each shop kind of takes a different type of currency. That's difficult. It's much easier just to change your own currency to whatever the universal currency is of where you're at. And then at that point, your money's valid all over wherever you're at. Every shop takes it. That's kind of what ATP's thing is. It gives us this universal energy currency. And so this is just, once again, a closer look where you can see there's three phosphates, and it's this third phosphate that we can take off. So you can see there's only two down here at the bottom. So one, two versus one, two, three. Uh, so in the process of doing this, in the process of ripping this phosphate off, it's going to give us energy. And then to actually stick that phosphate back on, it's going to take energy. So we're going to have to do these coupled reactions where we're going to have to break something down to let us build ATP. And we're going to be able to break ATP down to build other stuff. That's going to be this constant theme. And that will bring us to the end of this particular podcast. We're going to pick up with enzymes and the second half of chapter 6 or 8, whichever you want to think of it as. We'll pick up with that, and I'll put that up here in probably about a day. Hope you, had, hope you enjoyed this and had fun. Take it easy.